Okay. All right. Let's get started. Chelsea, whoever is here today gets one participation point. Huh? Well, that's the plus two. Is the participation point is a plus two, isn't it? What? What's what, what's the confusion? What a participation is a is a two. It's worth two. Those of you that already reached participation will just get plus two. Yeah. Yeah. All right, but that doesn't mean you don't participate today. Okay. Uh, let's have some recap questions so that we try to remember where we were last time before continuing the lecture. And anyway, you did the lab, so you're very familiar with the topic already, but let's keep going. If two acids have the same concentration, do they always have the same pH? Uh, I want new faces. Okay, so Amanda volunteers Danny. You know this. What's the answer? No. There you go. You got a participation. See how easy that was. Okay. Who's going to tell me why? Peter, you missed the plus two. Oh, you, he can get it. <laughs> Sam can get it too. Okay. Billy wants to tell me why. Yes, so pH is the measurement of the active hydronium ion, whereas the uh, concentration is the measure of, or the total acidity is the measure of the concentration of the total acid in both dissociated and non-dissociated state. And if you have a really uh, strong acid, it will be almost always in the dissociated state, like HCl, whereas organic acid, usually it's about 3%, 1 to 3% dissociated. So pH does not mean, same pH does not mean same concentration. Uh, what does the titratable acidity affect in food? Uh, Paul? Flavor. Yes, it impacts flavor and it's also an indication of maturity. Um, good. What does pH impact in food? Okay, Julian. Microbial growth. Were you going to say something different, Megan? What else? You know this. Same. Enzyme activity. Other chemical reactions can also happen. So enzyme activity, but disulfide linkages can happen at high pH with high temperature. So yes, pH impact. Uh, characteristics of food and safety of food. What is PKA, Sam? You were going to say that? Oh, you're going to ask a question. Right. That's a, that's a very good and thoughtful question. I like it. Yes, it impacts substrate, especially in the, in the protein where different charges will have different charges. And if the protein has different charges or it gets denatured, it might impact how the enzyme is going to work upon it. Yes, very good. Thank you, Sam. All right, so what is PKA? Equivalent of? Mm, not quite. Molly. Wasn't it a PA like a 
you're saying all the right words, you're not putting them in the right sentence. <laughs> but it's, you're close. Bullseye, yes. And it's the pH at which dissociated acid equals concentration of non-dissociated. So conjugate base equal non-dissociated acid in concentration. And at that pH, you have the maximum buffering capacity. All right, we'll talk about the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation in a minute. Okay. Can an organic acid buffer at multiple pHs and how come clear? He partially cor cor correct, you are going to add something? So yeah, we'll combine both answers together. When you have multiple carboxyl groups, and not all organic acids have multiple carboxyl groups. Uh, citric acid uh, has three carboxyl groups, and each carboxyl group will have a different pKa. So yes, it will buffer at three different pHs. Acidic acid has one carboxyl group, so it will have one pKa, so it will have one place where a hydrogen is donated, so it will have one buffering uh, capacity or one buffering pH. Okay, good. We can continue where we left off, and I think that was your last slide last time. And <clears throat> we were defining what titratable acidity was, and it's a measure of the concentration of the acid, again, whether it's dissociated or non-dissociated, in food. And you do that by titration with the base, and you've all done the lab, so we did that on beverages, so you're familiar with it already. And the organic acids that are common in foods are citric, malic, lactic, tartaric, um, etc. and usually every uh, food will have a dominant one. So in milk and dairy, lactic acid would be dominant. In apple, malic acid. In uh, citrus juices or like soda today, citric acid. Tartaric acid in grapes. So we always measure titratable acidity based on the dominant acid. That doesn't mean there are no other organic acids, but we just measure it based on the dominant acid. And how we measure it is either we use pH meter like you did in the lab for the apple juice or determining the endpoint with an indicator dye that the phenolphthalein indicator that we have used in lab. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the buffering principle. The buffering principle in, in the, by definition is when the, uh, there is a resistance for a pH change. And that happens when you have a weak acid and it is present as non-dissociated non acid, HA, non-dissociated acid, or AH, you can put it either way, and it's salt. We call it sometimes the conjugate base. That means when the carboxyl groups group loses a proton, it becomes COO minus, and we call that either the salt of the acid or the conjugate base. So both terms mean the same thing. So all acid, all food acids are weak, so all of them can buffer. So buffering occurs in food, and this is your favorite equation for from now till the end of the semester. Yeah. Okay, so pH equal pKa plus log of concentration of conjugate base over the concentration of non-dissociated acid. So when pH equal pKa, and that's what you defined earlier, um, Mallory. Okay, concentration of conjugate base equal concentration of non-dissociated acid, you'll have a value of 1. Log of 1 is 0. So then pH equal pKa, you have maximum buffering capacity. Because you have, every time you're titrating a drop of NOH, the non-dissociated acid is going to give it a proton and resist pH change. Okay. So with titratable acidity, by definition, we're doing titration. So at equilibrium, 
we have number of acid equivalents equal the number of base equivalents. A number of acid equivalents, milli equivalent, some, it's usually it's milli equivalent equal milli equivalent, right? So at equilibrium, or when we reach the, the neutralization, then you would have n by v equals n by v. And that's the equation you have used to calculate the concentration of HCl when you got the concentration of NUH in the lab. And that's when total acid neutralization is achieved. So when you use the phenolphthalein indicator, when you reached equilibrium, the next drop turned the phenolphthalein indicator to pink. And then you will see if when you were do doing the pH meter detection, you saw that the pH just creeped up all of a sudden. Why is that? Because you were depleting the HA, so you have a very low concentration here. And we have, when you have very low concentration and very high concentration of conjugate base, that number will be really high. So when you get that high number, the pH creeps up really quickly. So these, and you plotted titration curves. So this is an example of a titration curve when you have a really strong acid, when you're titrating HCl, for example. So here you, you see, um, no, you don't see a plateau. You see slight changes in pH, and then all of a sudden the pH goes up um, quickly. So you don't see a buffering zone because it's not a weak acid, it's dissociated, so there is no buffering of the pH. The pH keeps increasing until you get neutralization. So this is the titratable acidity uh, or no, sorry, the titration uh, graph of acetic acid. So acetic acid has one carboxyl group. So you will see a buffering zone around pKa of 4.7. So you see the pH increases, and then some sort of a low change in pH, kind of a plateau. And then after you, you pass the pH of 4.7, then you start seeing an increase in the pH until your conjugate base is much more concentrated than the non-dissociated non acid, you see a sharp increase, which is the equivalence point would be the midpoint of that sharp increase, and it falls around 8.2 to 8.4. This is citric acid, so it has three carboxyl groups, one, two, and three, so each one has a different dissociated dissociation factor, so you will have a different pKa value, and then you'll see that you have three buffering zones, that means three plateau area around pKa1, 3.0, pKa2, 4.7, and pKa3, 5.4. So you'll see what you did in the lab, you plotted formalic acid. We were not able to see the first pKa of malic acid because the pH of the starting juice was higher than the pKa of the, or the first pKa. So you probably just saw one between four and five. All right, let's do some calculation. Pull your piece of paper from last time. And apply your uh, Henderson-Hasselbach equation. Apply your Hasselbach equation. pH equal, I'm recording. <laughs> That's my daughter. You have a value already? You have a question? What? What's your question? No? 
Okay. So you need to apply the Henderson Hasselbalch equation. So what would be your approach first? Who is going to be the first? You're done? What is it? Seven point nine percent or eight percent? Hmm. What is that? The concentration of the uh, of the H plus H plus or H A. Uh, not not quite. What do you have, Billy? So the ratio is six point nine percent, but now you're after percent lactic acid, the dissociated, okay? That means the conjugate base of lactic acid. How would you determine that? You got stuck? Are you all stuck at that point, the 6.92 value? Then? What? Yes. Yes. What did you get? You haven't done yet? Okay. Continue with your thought. Yeah, hold on. You don't get participation <laughs> points. <laughs> okay, Billy, you have an answer. No. Is this the dissociated or the non dissociated? Yeah. Complicating things, Claire. You're you're heading in a complicated, yeah. Fourteen percent, but tell me the fourteen percent is it the dissociated or non-dissociated? No, then uh, you got it backwards a little bit. Riley. Ah, okay. Let me reveal. Okay, so you solve it, and you all got to this point, 6.92. So A minus plus HA equals 1, really, or 100%, right? Together, they're the 100% of the total concentration of your acid in dissociated and non-dissociated. So if you say HA equals 1 minus the concentration of A minus, then you substitute. So you're solving for A minus. And then you'll get that it is 0.87, so in percentage you multiply by 100, then that would be 87% of your conjugate base. And that means the dissociated state. You have a question? Um, how do you divide by the log? Because I know. How do I divide by the log? So this value, 4.7 minus 3.86, you get the log. So I think you need to do the anti-log on your computer, on your calculator. Yeah. Okay. Can, can you listen to what Billy said? I'm not sure how your calculators work, but Billy's going to explain it. So if you're in the log, you get a raise, you get a new 10 raised to the power of 1 log. Yeah. So then you do that on one side, so then the other side, whatever your number is on the other side, you just raise 10 by that power. So if your number is 0.84, you do 10 to the 0.84. Okay. Did you all get that? You need to know this because if I get you that on the exam, you need to know how you operate your calculator. It's very important that you know how to operate your logs on your calculator. Okay. 
All right, good. Do we have any questions on this? You do have a question. I don't get how to get from the far right to the top. This one? Yeah, to that. How did I get this? This? Oh, so, well, you either, together they are one unit, right? The non-conjugated and the conjugated add them together, that's one unit. But we want to get the percentage of it. So 0.87 of 1, what's the percentage of that? You multiply by. The 0.87 from? The 0.87 from? Yeah. Is you solve for A here. So you do algebra. It's called, take that as X. So you multiply 6.92 times 1 minus this. Okay, let me do it here on the board. All right, so, right, so you have A minus, and you have 1 minus A minus equals 6.92. And then you go A minus equals 6.92 into 1 minus that. And then you go 6.92 minus 6.92 A minus. And then you bring that here. Then you will have 7.92 A minus equals 6.92. So A minus equals 6.92 over 7.92. And then you should get 0.87. Yep. Good? We're all good? All right, so we talked about the rapid increase in pH because you are losing uh, the concentration is very low for the non-associated uh, acid, so you will see a large or a rapid increase in pH. So we can use a pH meter to determine the endpoint. The only disadvantage which some of you noticed in the lab, it takes a while for the pH meter to pick up uh, the change in pH. So you have to wait until you get a stable reading. So it's a slow response. Or you can do an indicator with the phenolphthalein indicator, which happens to change color between pH 8 and 9.6. So and around 8.2, you will see a change from colorless to pink, and that's uh, very good for us because we know that at around pH 8.2, the titration, there is the equivalence, you reach the equivalence. And why do we get, we, I said that in, that in lab, why is the endpoint 8.2, not 7? You remember? Why your endpoint for equivalence is a little bit basic? Usually you would think when you are neutralizing, you get to pH 7. Right, your salt, the salt that is from your acid, your A minus is a conjugate base, so that's going to raise the pH a little bit above 7. That's why our endpoint is a little bit basic, and it is uh, good that it is the pH at which you can see a color change for your phenolphthalein. So that works out perfectly. However, if you have phosphoric acid and carbonic acid, which you experience the carbonic acid in lab, it buffers at that pH. So you titrate, and then the color fades of phenolphthalein because that carbonic acid is buffering. So what happened is you overshoot, and that's why you got overestimation when you didn't boil off uh, carbon dioxide. So in this case, when you have this problem, when you have carbonic acid, it's better to do a pH meter. Then you will just stop at pH 8.2, even if you don't care about color fading or not, then you would get an accurate measurement of um, your titratable acidity. If you're working with tomato juice, let's say, it's dark, you won't see a pink color, then again, what you would do best for titrating or tomato juice is to do um, pH meter instead of phenolphthalein indicator. Okay, so we talked about CO2 in the lab and why you, you don't want to have CO2 in our water. And what you've seen in the lab is you've seen an ascarite trap. So you, the, the water was boiled for you and then there was a tube linked to a trap. 
That trap is, has silica coated with NOH. So the NOH captures CO2 and have, reacts with it and gives carbon, um, um, sodium carbonate. So the NOH will capture the CO2, then you will maintain uh, carbonate, um, CO2 free water. So one of the questions for your lab report asks you if you use tap water uh, versus boiled water, what do you expect the results to be? What do you expect when you use tap water versus the boiled water? So you expect to have carbonic acid in your sample and to overshoot titration. So you don't want to do that. And that's why we boil the water, put an ascarite trap, so that to prevent erroneous results. Also, uh, for the standardization of NOH is very important when we want to use it for titration. Because if you prepare NOH and let it sit for a while, it's going to interact with CO2 from its the surrounding environment, unless you flush with nitrogen. If you haven't, the CO2 will react with NOH and give you sodium carbonate, which would precipitate, it's a salt, and your normality will change. If you standardize, you'll get the exact normality. So your 0.1 normal might become 0.08 because some of the sodium hydroxide reacted with the CO2, so you reduce the concentration, but because of uh, standardization, you will know the exact normality of your NUH, even if it was prepared older, like the day before or two days before. And we standardize it, like you did in the lab, with a standard acid, which is the potassium acid phthalate that you've used in the lab to standardize it. Okay, let's do some calculations. So here we are trying, we're training you to, to think about how you prepare reagents, and in chemical reactions, you're actually going to prepare these reagents. So let's have some exercise. If you want to determine the number of moles of calcium in 25 grams of calcium chloride to, hydro, to water molecules. On the paper, for the same paper they're going to turn in later. What? You have two, uh, two molecules of water attached to the calcium. It's just, the period is not point, it's just telling you that this salt ha is hydrated. It has two hyd uh, hyd hydration, yeah. Okay, first of all, do you know the molecular weight of calcium? No. Nobody knows? 40. What about chloride? 0.5. And then hydrogen is 1. And what about oxygen? Yeah. Okay. What's number of moles equation? Number of moles equals? Thank you. Okay. You have it? No? I thought you were looking up that you have it. Anybody with an answer? Laura? Lauren? Um, 0.19. 19 You're off by a little bit. Yeah. 
So, you calculate the molecular weight of the entire uh, mo molecule. So 40 plus 71 plus 4 plus 32. You'll get 147 as the molecular weight. And the number of moles is 25 divided by the molecular weight. You'll get 0.17 moles. And this is the number of moles of the entire molecule, but since you only have one calcium, it would be the number of moles of calcium as well, okay? Because you have one uh, designation. All right, good. Let's do some more calculation. How would you prepare one liter of 0.2 molar NOH from, if your starting solution is three molar, and if your starting solution is 45% weight by volume. That's similar to some of the calculations for the lab that you had. Say that again. 0 0.07 what? And then what do you do with it? Yeah? No, not how. What do you do with that 0 0.07 liter? prepare it. So yes, it, your answer is correct. So what do you do with that volume? I'm sure she knows. Let me give her a chance. Yes, yes, that's what you do. Complete, that's exactly what I'm pushing you to do that because in an exam I want the complete answer. If you just give me the number, I don't know what you want to do with that number. You would say volumetric flask, one liter, I will put water, I'll add 0 0.07, which is, which is actually, it's 66.7 milliliter, I'll add that, and then make it up to volume. Complete the preparation. So the preparation is as important as calculating how to prepare it. Okay, from 45% now, anybody has that answer? Figure it out. Do you have it figured out? Oh, the molecular weight. What's the molecular weight of sodium? 23. 23. You don't get the answer. Yes. <laughs> okay, so the molecular weight of NOH is 40. 23 plus 16 plus 1. Then what do you do with that? <laughs> you can't help yourself. <laughs> you like that. Okay, so 45%, what does that mean? In 100. So it's 45 grams in 100. But when we are, we want molarity. So I want to convert that to per liter because molarity is number of moles per liter. So I want to make sure I have equal units. So the first thing I want to do is convert 45%, 45 grams in 100 to an equivalence per liter. Then you'll get the math that you need to determine the molarity. All right, so let me, so molarity, you want to get the molarity basically of this so that you can use the m by v equal m by v. 
So the first, the first thing you need to do is convert that to molarity. <coughs> so molarity equals number of moles, OK, <laughs> number of moles per liter. So the unit is liter. I want to get number of moles. I want the mass per liter. I have it in 45%, in so I have it 45 grams in 100 milliliter. So to convert that to 1,000 milliliter, so it's times 10, right? So it's 450 grams, right? If you, so it would be 1,000 times 45 by 100. So you have 450 grams in one liter. So you got the mass by converting it to per liter because that's what you want the final unit to be. So your number of moles will be 450 grams per liter over um, molecular weight, which is 40. Okay. So then you will get the number of moles here. And since this is one, number of moles per one liter would be equal molarity. So what was that number? 11.25 moles. That's the number of moles. And that would be 11.25 moles per liter. So or molarity. M. So now you have the original concentration and molarity, and you have the, li the one liter that you want to prepare and the final concentration. So you need to know how much you need, how much milliliter you need of that concentration. So what did you get? Did you solve it? OK, Billy. Convert it to milliliter, because it's always easier when you're actually preparing your reagents, so you want it in milliliter. Yeah, 17 milliliters and 983 milliliters of water. Right. So it's actually 17.8 to be exact. So you would solve it, n by v equal n by v. You get 17.8 milliliter. And then you add to water and make it up to one liter. All right. All right. Again, next semester, you're going to prepare buffers. Let's do exercise on how to prepare a buffer. Here, where you're going to use your uh, Henderson Hasselbalch equation. All on the same paper. If you need another paper, you can attach another paper. Oh, uh, by the way, on Moodle, under the week, wherever we are now, week 11 or 12, I don't know, there is a practice exercise sheet for pH and titratable acidity. Solve it, return it next Wednesday so that you don't have to worry about it during Thanksgiving for a plus five. Okay. It's either week 11 or 12, I can't remember. Huh? I don't you, if you go there, you'll find it either under 11 or 12. You'll see it. OK. How do you start? There are multiple ways of doing that. I have a way. Other people have a way. I think my way is simpler, but. What's the first thing you want to do? So you want to prepare one molar. You have acetic acid that is three molar. And the acetic acid is the non-dissociated uh, acid. 
And then sodium acetate is the salt of, the, of that acid. So it is the conjugate base, right? So think about the ha henderson hasselbalch equation. You always have the concentration of the salt and the concentration of the acid. So, and then I give you the molecular weight of the acetate powder. And you want one molar buffer. So the first thing you want to do is prepare a one molar concentration of the acid and the salt. That's the first thing you want to do. That's how I would approach it. Other people will leave it as such and get the concentration at the end instead of the amount of a milliliter of each that you want to mix together. So I standardize the concentration. I make sure that I have one molar of each. Then I try to determine how many milliliters of each I need to mix together to get that one liter of buffer. So give it a go. How would you get one molar of acetic acid? And how do you get one molar of sodium acetate? Start that calculation. And also you want to use, you have the dissociation factor. You just want to get the pKa, which is the negative log of that. Are you stuck on something? I feel I see some of you not not looking, not trying. How do I do the one molar? M by V equal M by V. I want to prepare one liter of one molar acetic acid. So we have three molar, and I want one liter of one molar. So what would be the volume of three molar that I need to get? That's the first step. Does anybody have that? Yes. OK, so we got that. So we get 333 milliliter of this, and we make up the volume. We got our liter of acid. Now we want to get our liter of the salt, which is the conjugate base. So molecular weight is 82. How much do I need to weigh? to get one molar. That means I want to prepare one mole solution, right? One mole in one liter. One mole here, molecular weight here, to get the weight. So it's basically equal to the molecular weight, right? So 82 grams dissolved in a liter will give you one molar. Are we all following? We got our one molar of acid and one molar of conjugate base. Now, what do I do next? Which equation I need to use? The henderson hasselbalch equation. Calculate pKa first and put pH equal pKa plus log A minus concentration over HA. What's pKa? Did anybody go that far? 4.76, at least my calculation. OK, now you have the pKa. You have the pH. Ta-da. Consider the concentration at, in volume now. The A minus, the concentration of A minus over the concentration of HA, think of them as just volume because they're both at equal, equal concentration. You, you prepare them at equal concentration. So you will be solving for volume, really. OK, guys, I see, I see confusion.
So we have our pH equal pKa uh, plus log A minus over HA. In this case, consider this as volume, not concentration, because they're both at one molar. They're both equimolar, okay? So you want to solve for the volume. How much of this I want to mix with how much of this, right? And A minus plus HA, you want one liter, right? You want one liter of this. So I substitute for HA, 1,000 minus A minus equals HA. So really, you're solving for the volume of A minus at this point. It's pretty simple, straightforward. Do not confuse it in your head. If you start with equal one, one molar, equal concentration, then you're solving for volume. To prepare one liter, you want some parts of this and some parts of that to mix them together, acid and salt. Mix them together to get one liter. So that's that. OK, anybody? Did you go that far? Sarah? Can you go back to how you solve for the sodium acetate powder? Like oh, so we have the powder. You want to know how much you want to weigh out of that powder to get one molar, right? You have one liter. You want to prepare one liter of that, and you need one molar. So, oh, I erased that. So number of moles equal mass over molecular weight. So you want to get this. And one molar equal one mole per liter. Right? That's a molarity. So this is one. And you have the molecular weight, which is 82 grams. So you weigh 82 grams in a liter. You get one molar. OK, did anybody solve this? Four hundred eight mils of what? Of the salt. Then the difference would be the acid. Right? So you will add 408 milliliter of sodium acetate, one molar, plus 592 milliliter of your one molar acetic acid. Mix them together, you get one molar, one liter of one molar buffer, 4.6 buffer. Here it is. Here are the calculations. Yeah, take a picture of it. That would be easier since we ran out of time. Again. No, you won't get them back. You won't get them back. Yes, just, just, just pass them over. OK, we didn't finish the lecture. Hold on. Don't leave. OK, Billy, you can explain later. So you can use this exam from nine years ago, quiz, to practice preparing another buffer using the following calculation. Guys, you need to know this. It will come in an exam for sure and you will need it next semester. So please practice. OK, I will continue after Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. What is? The slide, lecture slides?